This video is to complement your notes for page 208 of your notebook. This is also shared in the classroom through Google Slides. You also have a diagram on page 298 uh, of your notebook that goes through the structures. And a separate video was made to go through that entire diagram explaining many of these structures as well. So let's get right into the male reproductive system. First thing is some general terminology. Gonads are the primary sex organs. They produce the gametes, which are the sex cells. So they're going to produce the eggs and sperm. And um, they can produce hormones as well. So for males, we're talking about testes. Um, singular would be testis or testicle. And then ovaries for female. Now, if some of these go a little quick, you can always pause the video or you can go back to the original Google Slides to get them filled in. So gametes are the sex cells. We've got uh, sperm for male, uh, egg for female. For testes, they have endocrine and exocrine functions. So endocrine would be production of the testosterone, which we already know. And then exocrine means it's gonna go into a set of tubing. In this case, that would be the sperm going into ultimately uh, the vas deferens and then into the urethra to leave the body. A testicle is about the size of an olive. Okay, so here we see uh, an actual testicle with all the skin and connective tissue removed. Uh, here we see a diagram of it. This structure here is the epididymis. That's gonna lead to the vas deferens, which we can kind of see over here as well. Um, <clears throat> another thing that uh, attaches to this is the cremaster muscle. So right here we have the testis, but that is within the scrotum. The scrotum is controlled by this cremaster muscle. So that's going to move up and down to bring it closer or farther from the body to regulate its temperature, which is important for sperm production, which we'll get to at the end. The tunica albuginea is a fibrous connective tissue. It surrounds each testis. So here we can see um, the testis and then this is the protective coating. It's being pulled away so that you can see it. It protrudes into the testis and divides it up into sort of segments. And so these are called septa. So think about um, the septum of the heart or the septum of your nose being a division. It divides it. In each of those, you're going to have these lobules. And a lobule is going to have one to four sets of tubes that are tightly coiled up, and those are called the seminiferous tubules. The seminiferous tubules are really what is responsible for producing the immature sperm. They're going to complete their development later on. And so right here we see an entire testis, and then it's covered in the tunica albuginea, and you can see it's protruding inward, and it's dividing it up into these different lobules. And so these would be the septa, and then you have the lobule. Within that lobule is going to be a set of coiled up tubing. That tubing is producing the sperm, and those are called seminiferous tubules. They are going to lead into an area on the side, the reti testis. That's going to ultimately go into this comma-shaped region, which is called the epididymis. We're going to get to that in a moment. That's going to lead out to the vas deferens, and then we'll follow it from there. So what we're looking at here is a cross-section of a single seminiferous tubule. We only see a portion of it. So if you were to look down the end of a garden hose, it would look like a round circle and it would be hollow. So if I was looking through the end of one of these tubes, it would be a hollow space. The hollow space right here is called the lumen. And so what this is is actually the thickness of the tube itself made up of tissue. And so there's going to be stem cells that are down here that are going to produce the sperm. They work their way uh, interior, and eventually they get to the surface, interior surface of that tubing or hollow space, and that's where the sperm are going to be released. Once they're in that tubing, they can then be transported. So here's another view to give you that idea. So these are the seminiferous tubules. Right here, they're showing you a zoomed in version of that. They're cutting it in half, and then you're looking down the end of it. So this is the actual thickness of the tubing. This here is the hollow space. This is where the sperm are going to end up. 
So the production of those cells starts in this outer edge within the tissue, moves its way through through the process of development, and then is ejected into this space. Now these are still not fully functional sperm. This is just the first step. They need to be, then be transported into this area, uh, the reti testis, up in here to the epididymis, where they're going to continue their maturation before they're then released through the ductus deferens, also called the vas deferens. Okay, so just another view of that again. Here is um, the thickness of the tubing. Those cells started in here, worked their way down. Here are some sperm that are being made. So we kind of see this, the steps here. So spermatogonia are the stem cells that are going to make the sperm. The first set of um, this meiosis uh, is going to be meiosis 1, then meiosis 2. So that's going to give us a primary spermatocyte, and then a secondary spermatocyte, and then what we would kind of consider a sperm, which would be the spermatid. The um, testis has endocrine and exocrine functions. So uh, what we just talked about was the exocrine function. We produced that within a set of tubing. Uh, the endocrine function is going to be when this chemical is made and then distributed into the blood supply. And so the interstitial cells do that. They produce androgens, so male sex hormones or testosterone. So what we have here is some actual stained tissue. So again, tunica albuginea, protective coating, seminiferous tubule, seminiferous tubule, seminiferous tubule. Here's that white, that's hollow space. But look between the tubing, there's some extra tissue here. That's the interstitial tissue. This is what's making the testosterone. This is what's making the sperm. So now that we've produced the sperm, we need to transport it. So we have a duct system. So that is going to go from the testis to the epididymis to the ductus deferens, also called the vas deferens, and then into the urethra to potentially leave the body. The epididymis is sort of a comma-shaped, highly coiled tubule. If you could stretch it out, it would be 20 feet long, runs posterior laterally to it. So what's that mean? Down the side, lateral, and posterior to the back side of it. Okay, so that's going to be here. Then it's going to work its way back up. Here from an animal, uh, non-human, we have a dissected testicle. You can see the albuginia is here coating it. So it's that sort of shiny. Here you see can, it's removed, so we can kind of see more of those lobules. And then we can see the epididymis at the bottom. So what's the epididymis do? It provides temporary storage for immature sperm. They're going to spend about 20 days there working their way through this tubing. Um, they gain the ability to swim now. Right now they can't swim. That's what people tend to think of for the movement of it. But at this point, it's actually going to be peristalsis that's working its way through the tubing. Uh, once it gets the signal, the epididymis walls can contract and then expel the sperm, and that sends it into the vas deferens, also called the ductus deferens. Uh, the ductus deferens goes up through the inguinal region. So remember, we learned this term very early in the year, um, sort of meant groin, where the, bot, uh, where the uh, leg sort of meets the trunk, that general region. Maybe you've heard of an inguinal hernia. That would be um, a type of stress that was in this region. So it's going to then go upward. It's going to go over the bladder, uh, the urinary bladder. And so the vas deferens is enclosed within a larger structure called the spermatic cord. This is a connective tissue that has uh, the vas deferens, some blood vessels, and nerves. So here again is the testis, epididymis. Now running up through this, they've got it here in yellow, is the vas deferens, but there's a lot of other things here too. So we have veins, we have arteries, we have nerves. All of those bundled together are made into something called the spermatic cord. That is going to empty into the ejaculatory duct, and from there it's going to pass through the prostate to the urethra. Um, so right here, what they're showing us is actually a vasectomy. They've cut the ends of the vas deferens, and so we're going to see a, a vasectomy here in a moment. Um, basically, by cutting the vas deferens here, sperm can still be produced in the testis, 
So sperm can still be produced down here, but they can't get out anymore. Now, up here are the glands. So the glands that contribute to the production of semen to make that fluid can still be produced. The testis can still make testosterone, which is absorbed directly into the blood. So when a person has a vasectomy, they are normally still able to be sexually active um, and still be able to produce fluid that can be released, but that fluid doesn't contain the sperm because they can't get quite past this point where it was cut. Now, coming back to uh, that ejaculatory duct, we said that this vas deferens comes up over the superior part of the bladder and then comes down. Here we have a seminal vesicle we're going to see later. Uh, that is going to join together to make the ejaculatory duct. That's going to come down to get to the urethra and then out through the body. And this right here is the bladder. So vasectomy is going to cut or cauterize that vas deferens. Remember, tomi means to cut. So in this case, we're cutting the, um, the vas deferens. So they might make a little incision in some cases. They can actually pull that tube out and cut it. There's other methods of surgery for this, but this is one of them. The urethra is the tube that goes from the uh, bladder to the tip of the penis. Because of the length of the penis uh, necessary for uh, intercourse for um, delivering the sperm, it's longer than the uh, urethra for a female. Um, so because it has to go through the length of the penis in addition, it actually has three regions. So the part of it that goes through the prostate gland is called prostatic urethra. Then there's a section called membranous urethra that sort of connects it um, to the area called the spongy urethra, which is also sometimes referred to as the penile urethra. So the spongy urethra is the part that actually runs through the length of the penis. The other two are more internal. So kind of looking at that, here we have the bladder. Here we have the prostate gland. Here we have the shaft of the penis. So the part going through the prostate gland is the prostatic urethra. The part that connects them is the membranous urethra. And then through the length here is the spongy urethra. The urethra is uh, different in males than females in that it serves an excretory and reproductive function. It delivers both semen and urine. Um, when the ejaculation occurs, there are sphincters. So remember what a sphincter is, a circular cuff of muscle, um, typically uh, involuntary, but uh, sometimes they're voluntary if they're skeletal muscle. So what we're seeing here is uh, the bladder. And then there is an internal muscle here. That's the internal sphincter. That can close off and pinch this off to prevent urine from being able to get into the tube. Then below the prostate gland, there is an external um, uh, muscle, uh, sphincter. So it prevents urine from entering the urethra, but also it prevents sperm from going backwards and getting up into the bladder. So it's sort of a shutoff valve. Okay, so again, this is the diagram that we've already labeled in our notes. And so we can kind of see again just this pathway. So you can come back and look at that. Now, uh, in terms of accessory glands, we're really talking about the seminal vesicles, which there are two of them, the prostate gland and the bulbal urethral glands. Semen is the sperm containing fluid uh, that is going to contribute to delivery. Here we have an egg with um, many, many sperm on it. We're going to come back and talk about that later in this unit. Seminal vesicles are really located at the base of the bladder. Um, so it's not shown here, but right here would be where the bladder is. And they produce 60% of the volume of the semen. It's sort of a thick yellowish secretion, contains sugar, vitamin C, and then prostaglandins. So remember, those are localized hormones. And they serve to sort of nourish and activate the sperm. You know, at this point, they're really not um, swimming. Yeah, they've been propelled by peristalsis into this region. So the duct of the seminal vesicles joins with the vas deferens, and it forms the ejaculatory duct. So 
Here's that vas deferens coming up over the bladder and down. Here's the seminal vesicle that's coming down. This, these two form together to be the ejaculatory duct. So we're adding uh, fluid from the seminal vesicle with the sperm and actually creating the semen. So then that's going through the prostate gland. It's going to join with the urethra, which is coming down. And then that's going to come down uh, through the spongy urethra of the penis or penile urethra. The prostate gland is a single gland. It encircles the urethra, backing up for just a moment. Because it surrounds the urethra, sometimes if this becomes enlarged, it can uh, cause problems with urination because it can constrict this. It's about the size of a chestnut, produces a milky fluid, and it really activates the sperm now so they're going to be able to start swimming. You don't really need them to start swimming yet because they can be propelled by the body. It's once they're out of the body, they really need that ability to swim to find um, the egg that they want to fertilize. Uh, a prostate gland uh, also sometimes needs to be checked to make sure that it's not cancerous or having uh, some other problem. So uh, not a routine thing for younger men, but unless there's some sort of history or reason to be checking it. But as they get older, this may need to be checked. A lot of times this prostate gland can be felt somewhat through uh, the base of the peritoneum of the pelvis, but sometimes they need to do an exam rectally. And so because of its position right next to the large intestine, uh, it can be uh, palpated or felt through the wall of the intestine to kind of get an idea of its health. Bulbal urethral glands are about the size of a pea. They're inferior to the prostate gland. An older name for them is the Cowper's gland, so you will encounter that. And this produces a thick, clear mucus that drains into the penile urethra, and it's the first secretion that exits uh, the penis when sexually excited. Its function is really to cleanse the urethra of any acidity that might have been left behind from urine. And then also because it comes out first, it acts as a lubricant during intercourse. So looking at those glands again, we have the seminal vesicles, we've got the prostate gland, and then we have the bulbal urethral gland or Cowper's gland. And then notice that we've got some of the urethra here, only the part within the penis is that penile or spongy urethra. And so this is going directly to that. The semen then is a mixture of all of these substances and it is the transport medium for the sperm. Uh, it also contains fructose to give that sperm some energy because it does have mitochondria. It is actively swimming. Uh, those mitochondria are not going to be something that entered the egg. All of your mitochondria does come from your mother or, and are contained within the egg. And we'll get back to that um, when we get to that topic. The semen, though, is a little bit alkaline, and it helps neutralize the acidity of uh, the environment of the vagina. So the vagina is a little bit acidic, um, and so the sperm is a little bit basic, and it helps to um, protect the sperm so that acidity isn't as hostile to them. And this is a good protective barrier that we'll talk about um, later on on another day. Some other things that are contained in here, seminal plasmin is an antibiotic. Um, to help inhibit bacterial growth. Um, when the penis is inserted, it may have bacteria on it. We don't want to spread a bacterial growth inside the vagina, so this antibiotic helps um, with that issue and for some other reasons. Also contains a hormone called relaxin, which plays an important role. It contains enzymes that help enhance sperm mobility, and it dilutes the sperm down so that it can swim. Initially, when they're produced, they are extremely crowded together. Uh, so just picture being in an extremely crowded hallway and your movement is very slow and restricted. If you could spread out, you could travel better. And that is what the sperm does. It spreads them out. Excuse me, this, uh, the semen does. It spreads those sperm out. Uh, typically, in a normal ejaculation, it's two to five milliliters, which is equivalent to about one teaspoon. 
in one milliliter can have anywhere between 50 and 130 million sperm. So there is a huge number of sperm that can be released, but only one of them is going to fertilize the egg, and most of them don't make it there. So now going to the external genitalia, that is really the scrotum in the penis. The scrotum, of course, is the sac of skin that the testes are in. And it's a divided sac. And one of the things it does is it lowers the body temperature. Uh, optimal sperm production you know, is about three degrees Celsius below normal body temperature. And so by getting it away from the body, it reduces that body temperature. If it gets cold, that cremaster muscle contracts, pulls it closer to the body, sort of snugs it up to the core of the body more to warm it, to try to keep that uh, best temperature for sperm production. The penis itself has some parts. The length of the penis is the shaft. The uh, enlarged tip is called the glans penis. And then there are folds of skin that sort of form a cuff that surround the end of that, and that's called the prepuce. More commonly, that's called the foreskin, and that is what is surgically removed in a circumcision. So you've got the shaft, here's the glans penis, and in this case, there is no foreskin on it. And in this case, you can't really see that shape from it because this fold of skin is down. So somebody who's uncircumcised will have this, Somebody who's been circumcised, this skin has been cut off, and then this part is uh, exposed. And then we've got the scrotum. Looking internally, um, <clears throat> there's the urethra. So that's what the sperm is going to be transported through, released. Surrounding that is a tissue called the corpus spongiosum. Within the penis, there is a large um, sort of muscular area called the corpus cavernosum. This is what engorges with blood in order to make the penis erect to allow it um, to penetrate, but it creates such a great pressure that the corpus spongiosum uh, helps to keep the urethra open. In other words, if this uh, engorged with blood and pressed against this tube, it would collapse it and might prevent uh, the semen from being released. So this spongiosum helps to keep it open. Internally, the spongy urethra is surrounded by three layers of tissue called erectile tissue. That's part of what we were just uh, looking at. And that really concludes the anatomy of the male system. The next topic would be physiology. So that was going to deal more with actual sperm production and um, what is involved in the creation and maturation of sperm.